Well, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, whenever and wherever this finds you. Hope you're doing well. We're going to continue tonight in our study in the book of Hebrews. In fact, we're going to conclude the study of Hebrews chapter number 13 tonight. Love your fellow Christians. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 1. The writer of Hebrews says this, Let brotherly love continue. Let's look at um, the command to love in the Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 14, Paul says this, Let all that you do be done in love. John, his epistle says this, 1 John 4, 8, anyone, anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. Peter, in his epistle, says in 1 Peter 4, 8, Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. And then the Old Testament, Moses writes in Leviticus 19.18, You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Well, love should be the hallmark feature of the Christian. We should be known by our love for each other. In fact, the Apostle John said that we'll know of our love for him, that is God, by our love we have for each other. So both Old and New Covenants, the command has been that we love each other. In fact, that is the predominant feature, characteristic that God has, an attribute that God has, is love. And we're never more like God than we are when we are loving other people. So love each other. The next point we'll look at is love people that you don't know. Verse 2. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. You know, this could spark a very lengthy discussion, but I'll just say what the writer of Hebrews says here is this, that angels can take on the appearance of humans. Now, we see this in the Old Testament. We do see uh, the story of the two angels going down to Sodom and Gomorrah and warning Lot to leave, uh, to leave the city. They, were, they looked like men. In fact, they looked like men so much that the men of the city wanted to sodomize them and take them into their own bedrooms. Uh, but the idea is that these angels can sometimes manifest a human appearance, and not with glowing bright light and halos and wings, but look like just you and I. And the writer of Hebrews says, look, show love to people that you know, and show love, hospitality, uh, kindness to people that you don't know, even strangers. Because who knows, you may be entertaining angels unaware. Verse 3, remember those who are in prison as though in prison with them and those who are mistreated since you also are in the body. You know, we don't often emphasize this in church, but prison ministry is very important. Uh, it's important to visit those who are in prison who committed crimes against humanity, crimes against the state, uh, crimes against their neighbors. Now, in the context that Hebrews was written, it's written at a time when Christians were being imprisoned. It was the beginning of the persecution of the Christians by Rome. Uh, so we, we have to understand the context of the imprisonment, of course, was uh, those who are saints who are imprisoned. But I think it has a broader application. I don't think that we ought to just uh, remember those in prison who are just believers in Christ, but also do ministries in prison to those who don't know Christ, because what a great opportunity to hear the gospel and to actually reform your life than when you're in prison. Many folks who are um, who commit crimes on the outside of the prisons and involved in those lifestyles don't enter a church and don't think about God even twice during their lifetime, but yet they get in prison and they get a chance to go to a chapel service or be a part of a prison ministry and they'll take the opportunity because you know they offer them um, they may offer them donuts and and coffee, but it's a chance to get out of their typical routine. They go to this chapel service and it's then they hear the gospel. So we should support prison ministries, whether we go ourselves or take literature to the church, uh, to the jails from our, you know, we, at our church, we recycle Sunday school literature. And when we finish a quarter Sunday school literature, we keep those books, those materials in very good shape. And we take them right to our local jail and they, they take those in and they, uh, they have it, the prisoners uh, check those out and use those as they see fit. So love those that you know, love those that are strangers, Next is love your spouse. The writer of Hebrews says in verse 4, Let marriage be held in honor among all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. 
Now, we don't often think of it this way because sex has such a, I guess, bad reputation, bad connotation that we think that sex is dirty and sex is something that we should be uh, not talk about, or if we do, it's in hushed tones. But sex is a gift from God. In fact, when God made the first couple, Adam and Eve, he made them for the purpose of sex, of procreation, and recreation, in fact. So sex is not a bad thing, but it's only good within the context of marriage. Anytime sex occurs outside of the context of a devoted partnership, a marriage before God, then it, it, it is sinful. A sex outside of marriage uh, is fornication. Sex to someone outside of your married bed is adultery. So sex is, is only holy and good from God if it is done like anything else within proper, proper bounds. So love those you know. Love strangers, and then love your spouse. And now here's a don't. Don't fall in love with money. Verse 5. Keep your life free from the love of money, and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Now we know from 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10, that the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. It's the love and the desire to obtain money. That money, if that becomes your passionate pursuit in life, then you'll step on people and walk over people to get money. If, uh, if the, your highest pursuit in life is to gain money, then you'll get it oftentimes by dishonest means. So what the writer of Hebrews here is, is obviously saying is, uh, don't fall in love with money. Don't you know, love people, uh, love your spouse, but don't love money. People who love money often go down a road that's uh, very dangerous in the long run. Now, is there anything wrong with money? No. Money is a morally neutral thing. It's no different than a shovel or an automobile. It's just a thing. It is a means to an end, right? A car is a means to get you to a place. A pickaxe is a means to break up rocks. Uh, dental tools or means to uh, extract a tooth. But money is a means to barter, to buy things. Money is just a, is just a tool. Now, if money becomes your sole pursuit in life, uh, then it becomes an idol and, of course, uh, is something that you worship and you ought not do that. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what can man do to me. Of course, verse 6 ties back to the end of verse 5. I will never leave you and forsake you, God has promised. And we can confidently say, if God has promised not to leave us or forsake us, that the Lord is our helper. And he, here he quotes Psalm 118.6. The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? So, of course, in the context of the writer of Hebrews' is writing to the persecution of Christians in the uh, the early part of the second half of the first century in the 60s or so, um, when property is being confiscated by persecution, he's saying, God will take care of you. God is your helper. God is your means. And God will see you through those persecutions. But, but don't pursue um, wealth and hold on so tightly to that, that that becomes your pursuit in life. So we've looked at love, love, what to love, what not to love. So why is love the hallmark feature of Christianity? Why is love the hallmark feature of Christianity? Well, I think it is the hallmark feature of Christianity because it is the defining attribute of God. God is sovereign, but He loves sovereignly. God gives justice, but He, he gives justice lovingly. God is omniscient, but He knows all things lovingly, so to speak. God forgives, but He does so lovingly. 1 John 4.12 says, God is love. And I think that's that's how we look at Christ. You know, how does how do we know that God loves us? John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. The greatest act of love ever known to man is that God would condescend, become flesh, and would humble himself to the point of death. And that is the greatest act of love the world has and will ever know. And so while we are not called to sacrifice ourselves for others, we are called to love each other sacrificially. Imitate godly people. Imitate godly people. Verse 7. Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their faith, of their way of life, and imitate their faith. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. It is our duty to 
to remember the godly people who shared the Word of God. You know, we as Christians aren't on an island. We find ourselves, when we come to the faith, being discipled, and sometimes by very ungodly people, but hopefully by godly people who took the time and knew the Word of God and let us uh, taking our hand down the path through the scriptures. And the writer of Hebrews, as he closes this out, says, don't forget those folks who taught you the word of God. Remember them compassionately. But he said here to imitate their faith. I want to show you some verses from the Apostle Paul where he says this in uh, three other passages here. 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, Paul says this, Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. 1 Corinthians 4.16, I urge you then, be imitators of me. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 9. It was not because we do not have that right, but, give, but to give you in ourselves an example to imitate. So it is good advice to imitate godly men and women. In fact, one, of the, one means of discipleship in the church is that we mentor or take people in, under our wings um, to mentor and disciple them. And, and one way we do that is by, by example. We live by example. So uh, it's not that Christians don't get cancer. It's that we get cancer and die with dignity. It's not that Christians don't have hardships and difficulty and divorce and trials. It's that we go through those things and in going through them, we have a sense of dignity, a sense of, um, a sense of honoring God through those processes. Uh, so we have to keep that in mind that people are watching our behaviors and may imitate us to know how a Christian ought to act. So if we are Christians, we ought to be an example to others who are coming after us. And hopefully we've had good mentors and good examples before us so we know how to handle um, difficulties in our life. Let's move on now. See if I can't get us to the next slide here. I'll look at the doctrine called the, immutab the immutability of Christ. It's easy for me to say here. The immutability of Christ. We'll be looking here uh, as we continue in the book of Hebrews. In, number, in verse number 8 in just a moment. My PowerPoint jumped out, so i got to reload this. But I'll pick it up exactly where we were a moment ago. And I'll just give you a brief definition off the top of my head what immutability means, and then we'll look at the actual definition from, uh, from a theological dictionary, and then we'll discuss what that means as we look at verse, verse number 8 here, I believe. I'm clicking through here, I'm moving on down, and this should, this should load us up here. Verse number 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now this, I must say, before we go into the definition of immutability, is that this refers to the divine nature of Jesus. The divine nature. Jesus Christ is the only um, person in the Godhead and the only person in existence who is like Him. He is the perfect marriage of the divine nature and the human nature into one. God the Father does not possess that. The Holy Spirit does not possess that. And while you and I possess the Holy Spirit, we don't have a divine nature in ourselves. So this is going to refer to Christ being the same that refers to his divine nature. Let's define immutability. The immutability of God, his quality of not changing, is clearly taught throughout Scripture. For example, Malachi 3, 6, God says this, I, the Lord, do not change. It's also mentioned in Numbers 23, 1 Samuel 15, Isaiah 46, and Ezekiel 24. Now, if God is immutable, does not change, and the writer of Hebrews says that Jesus Christ is immutable, does not change, then the conclusion is, of course, that Jesus Christ is God. Now, what, what ramifications, what consequences does it have to look at Christ as being immutable or unchanging? Well, I think it has three implications here when you say God does not change. The first is this, He does not age with the passing of time. I mean, we say that God doesn't exist in time. Well, God doesn't exist in our time. Uh, God exists in whatever heaven time would be, right? Because things do happen linear, linearly in heaven. Things do happen in the passage of some kind of a time in heaven. People worship, sing, do things, and that implies 
that time passes. But the idea that God does not change indicates he does not age. He doesn't get old or get liver spots on his skin or lose his hair or become forgetful. God doesn't experience the effects of aging as we do because he's an eternal being. Also, we say that God is immutable. We say he can't become better and he can't become worse. When Christ added himself to human nature, he didn't become better and he didn't become worse. He didn't lessen himself in the sense that he became less God. So when we say that God is immutable, we, we mean that he's a perfect being and there's nothing you take uh, away from God or add to God that would make him more perfect because he simply is already perfect and is immutable. Why would you change perfection? And then number three, when we say God's immutable, it also touches upon his omniscience. God can't learn more. If God learns something new, uh, he would not be truly inherently immutable. He'd be uh, changing and, and adapting to what he learns. He'd be uh, evolving, so to speak, picking up new information. God doesn't add new information. God knows the beginning from the end. He knows all time and all things that can be and will be known. God knows it all. So he cannot learn more. Now let's get to the question. How could Jesus become man or human and not change? Well, we know that when he was a, an infant, he was born and he, he, like any child, would go through development. He would learn to eat solid food and he would uh, grow teeth and uh, he would walk on his own and he'd be potty trained and toilet trained, right? And he would grow and progress. He'd go through adolescence and he'd go through the physical changes. He transitioned from childhood to adulthood. And in fact, he did change a lot. In fact, the book of uh, the Gospel of Luke says that Jesus Christ grew both in wisdom and stature. He grew in wisdom and stature, meaning he got bigger, right? It's a stature and he grew in wisdom. He acquired, um, you know, more information. Now, this speaks in the Gospel of Luke to the human nature of Christ. So we're going to divide Christ into really two parts. While it's not fair to do so, I just want to conceptualize what this doctrine touches upon. Christ's divine nature is immutable. It does not change. But when he adds a human nature to himself, he never changes divine nature. He's still holy and righteous and above sin and all those kind of things that he possesses, those attributes of God. He adds a human nature so that he could, you know, ultimately go and die on a cross. But adding human nature didn't change who Christ was in his essence. He was and is and always will be eternally God. As old as God himself, he is in fact God himself. So adding human nature to Christ did not change in essence who he was. He maintained his divinity all throughout. Let's continue on. Verse number nine. Do not be led astray uh, be not, do not be led away by diverse and strange teachings, for it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace, not by foods which have not benefited those devoted to them. And he's touching upon the Old Covenant dietary laws, which we've already established Christ is superior to those things. Verse 10, we have an altar from which those who serve the tent have no right to eat. Now, the dietary laws were resolved when Christ fulfilled both the ceremonial and sacrificial laws of the Old Covenant. I don't have to emphasize this any more than the Apostle Paul has done. He wrote, in fact, a letter called Galatians to the churches in Galatia about the Judaizer heresy. And they were teaching that circumcision and dietary laws and those trappings of the Old Covenant were necessary for man to uh, either get saved or to stay saved. And the writer of Hebrews has already said to this point, several times that Christ uh, in, is superior to, better than, the Old Covenant in, in a lot of different ways. Greater than Moses, greater than angels, greater than the sacrificial system, greater than the priesthood of Levi. He's already above those things here. So we don't have to go back and uh, rework all those important doctrines that Christ is better than the Old Covenant. But here the writer of Hebrews is using this now figuratively. We have an altar from which those who serve the tent have no right to eat. He's referring to those who now preach the doctrines of grace have no right to go back under the old doctrines of the old covenant and dietary laws and those kinds of things. We have no right to preach and teach those things since we've moved beyond that. Now, were those laws good? Of course they were, but they were never salvific. They, those laws were never meant to save a man or to keep a man saved. They were meant to demonstrate obedience 
uh, to what God had said them for them to do. They were not meant to keep a man saved or get a man saved, but to show that they were obedient to God. So why do, new, why do new covenant believers have no right to eat dietary laws? That's, I know it's a funny question to ask. Eating the food on this altar. We have no right to partake or tie ourselves up to dietary laws. First of all, because those dietary laws under the old covenant were never meant for us. They were never meant for Christians in the new covenant. They were only meant for Jews under the old covenant. Nowhere in the New Testament are we, for, are we told to eat or to avoid eating certain foods, except uh, in the situation that offends our weaker brother. You know, in the first first council of the church in Acts chapter 15, they said two things. You know, to the apostle Paul, who who had to verify his Christian ministry, ministry work in Antioch, he said uh, two things: don't eat meat sacrificed to idols and avoid sexual immoral behavior. Let's take that back to Antioch for practice. Now, why? Because the meat sacrificed to idols, as Paul would tell us in his letter to the Corinthians, was an offense to the weaker brother. Now, who's the weaker brother? But the weaker brother is a brother in Christ whose conscience isn't as refined as those who've walked with Christ. You know, in Christ we have grace and liberty and freedoms to do things we, would, we di they didn't have under the old covenant because it's a new covenant era. We don't we're not bound by ceremonial laws. We're not bound by the old covenant civil laws. Uh, we're bound by the moral laws of the old covenant, the Ten Commandments, but not the ceremonial laws. We don't have to uh, do the things they said on the old covenant about what we eat or how we wash our hands or getting mold from our houses. Those don't bind us. So first, they were never meant for us in the New Covenant to obey. But secondly, um, they don't make us any more righteous. Right? So you can go to the Old Testament and say, I'm going to not eat shrimp anymore because it's a shellfish or lobster or crab. Right? I'm going to eat that stuff. And I'm going to do that and show how committed I, committed I am to Christ. Well, if your conscience says you shouldn't eat shellfish, you're demonstrating the fact that you are a weaker brother. You are a person who is bound by law and not by grace, the spirit of the law, so to speak. So we're not bound by Old Testament laws as the Old Covenant believers were. I welcome your thoughts on that because sometimes we, we run to read the Bible and say, well, all these laws apply to us. And in fact, um, Many of the laws don't apply to us in the Old Covenant. We have to kind of determine which one uh, in its context relates to new, new Christian believers. Verse 11, For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy places by the high priest as a sacrifice for sin are burned outside the camp. Now, notice that the writer of Hebrews is writing this in present tense. The bodies of those animals you know, who are sacrificed on the altar, when they're done with the sacrifices, what remains of them are brought outside the camp and buried. That was still going on at the time of the book of Hebrews, as the temple was still in place in 70 AD. Verse 12. So Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the, the people through his own blood. Now, Jesus was literally crucified outside of the city of Jerusalem. And this is a perfect parallel. He is our, he is both priest and the Lamb of God. He sacrificed himself, died sacrificially, giving his life a ransom for many outside the city of Jerusalem on Golgotha, a, city where, a hill outside the city where people were executed. Verse 13. Therefore, let us go to him outside the camp and bear the reproach he endured. For here we have no lasting city. We seek the city that is to come. Now, as Christians, our ultimate hope should be heaven, not on this earth. And while Christ was crucified outside of the camp, literally, outside of the city, literally, we're to uh, be content to endure the shame, bear our own cross, and realize that uh, being outside the city is a euphemism for being um, content with being expelled from the community. As Christ was expelled from the Jewish community by the Sanhedrin and crucified, so we should be content uh, if, the community if the community ostracizes us and expels us as well. 
question. The next question, what is the ultimate hope of the Christian? Well, our ultimate hope is not on anything on this earth. Nothing we can see, taste, touch, smell, handle. Our hope is in nothing on this earth. Our hope is ultimately in heaven. Verse 15. Through him, that's Jesus, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of of lips that acknowledge his name. And the only sacrifice that we Christians are called to offer is the sacrifice of worship, worship and good works to Christ. And we'll see in a moment here. You know, we're not called to take an animal down to the local altar in the woods out somewhere, uh, that someone's makeshift altar, and then sacrifice a, you know, a goat or a bull or a ram, nothing like that, because our ultimate high priest, Christ, offered himself as Lamb of God, I said a moment ago, and He is our He is our sacrifice. So what we offer in in turn is sacrifice of worship and praise and good works to Him. Verse sixteen: Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. You know, worship and acts of service, uh, service to others, are pleasing to God. Um, maybe. You think that the only way that I can offer something to God is to go to church and put some tithe in the offering plate. Well, you can do that. I mean, you do that. Hopefully, it supports the work of that church. If it's a if it's a Bible believing, Bible teaching fellowship of believers, hopefully, you, when you give your offering, that does go to. It's not being wasted. It's being stewarded, and it goes to support missionaries and the work of that church, even to pay the light bills of that church for a place of gathering. But when you clean the gutters. Of your neighbor who can't do it him or herself when you uh, cut their grass or buy their groceries for them that is a an act of service that's pleasing to God we'll continue on here verse 17 obey your obey your leaders and submit to them for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account let them do this with joy and not be and not with groaning for what would be of no advantage for that would be of no advantage to you. Verse 18. Pray for us. Now he's obviously a, a church leader, the writer of Hebrews. For we are sure that we have a clear conscience desiring to act honorably in all things. Verse 19. I urge you the more earnestly to do this in order that I may be restored to you sooner. Now it's implied in this text here that submitting to church leaders is required as long as they keep watch over our souls and that we should pray for them as we submit to them. Now, people say things like this, you know, they, they take the Old Testament passage, you know, uh, touch not God's anointed. You shouldn't criticize preachers. You shouldn't and I've heard people, you know, when you when you hear someone quote that, it's a surefire sign they are a false teacher. I've heard Benny Hinn quote that about himself. You know, you, you talk bad about my ministry. Bible says, "Touch not God's anointed." Well, first of all, if he calls himself God's anointed, he's saying he's he's the Messiah, right? I guess that's what the anointed one means. That was a reference clearly to David in his ministry in the Old Testament. What he was doing, that you know, he was a man of God certainly. But should you submit to anybody that says he's a pastor? Should you submit to anybody that has religious authority in this life? Not at all. It's implied that you should submit to church leaders as long as they keep watch over your souls. The televangelist you watch at three in the morning and ask for your money has no concern for your soul whatsoever. The televangelist preaching the prosperity gospel says, send me your money and I'll send you a prayer cloth and a bottle of oil. You send me money and God's going to bless it tenfold. He is not watching out for your soul whatsoever. He's not feeding on the, uh, he's not feeding the flock. He is feeding on the flock. He's not watching after the soul. He's cannibalizing the souls of others. He's taking advantage of them. So you have only no obligation not to support a minister who is, um, who's not keeping watch over the flock. But you have an obligation to call out false teachers who are cannibalizing the flock. So keep that in mind. Well, what is one function of God, godly leaders? Of course, it's to teach the Word of God, to be faithful to the Word of God. But here in this passage we've looked at, one function of God, godly leaders is to be an example, to live a life pleasing to God in all that they do. That is an example. That is what 
godly leaders should be doing, be an example. And we're getting close to the end here. Verse number 20. Now may the God of peace who brought again, who brought again from the, the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the, of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant. And before we finish that thought, let me just capture this idea here is, the same God who raised Christ Jesus from the dead is our God. He is the God of peace. And it says here that uh, the Lord Jesus is the great shepherd of the sheep. Now, the word shepherd in Greek is apoimen, which means, you know, pastor, which just means shepherd. Jesus Christ is our, is our great overseer of the flock. What's he going to do? He's going to equip you with every good work, verse 21, that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, it sounds like with the amen, he's finished writing, but he's got a couple more things to say before he finishes this up. But let's just say this. The Holy Spirit will work in us in order to ensure that we are doing the perfect and pleasing will of God. Christ is our shepherd, and he promised in the Gospel of John that when he would ascend to the Father and leave us, that he would leave us not helpless or alone. He would leave us with the Comforter. And of course, the Holy Spirit indwells the believers and works in us uh, to work out our salvation. Verse 22. I appeal to you, brothers, bear with my word of exhortation, for I've written to you briefly. Now, I don't know if you consider 13 chapters brief, but consider what he could have written to the church, the churches there in Jerusalem, to the Hebrew Christians. It was probably brief. He says, bear with my word of exhortation. Now, exhortation refers to encouragement. In fact, the gift of exhortation is often called the gift of encouragement. The Greek word is perikale, perikaleo, which means to encourage others. In fact, you hear it within that parakletos, which means the, the comforter, the, uh, the Holy Spirit is our encourager and our comforter here. But what's the book of Hebrews about in summary so we get to verse 22 of chapter 13? We wrap this thing up. It is written to encourage us, to exhort us. To those that read this, it's written to encourage us to keep walking the faith that Christ has put before us. It's to keep on the path of where Christ has placed us on and to not turn back. It's a warning to not turn back to the, old, the trappings of the Old Covenant. Now, this doesn't that doesn't relate to us so much these days, but it does help in our sanctification to know that Christ, in fact, um, is our great high priest. It looks like we've lost power on the device here, so we'll, we'll wrap that up tonight. Uh, and I appreciate you guys sticking this out with me. The writer of Hebrews um, would have us to heed the warning not to turn back to the Old Covenant, but also would have us to uh, follow in Christ, who is superior to all trappings of the Old Covenant. And as the writer of Hebrews would say, that grace and peace be with us all. I appreciate you guys sticking this out. Uh, go back and read the book of Hebrews sometimes if you want to see uh, a good work of theology uh, on who the person and work of Christ is. The book of Hebrews is a great place to start. Well, I appreciate you guys again sticking this out. God bless you. Let us close out in prayer. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for this day and all the blessings of life. We thank you for the ways in which you've carried us to this point of our sanctification. We thank you that you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, who came and gave himself for us, that we could have life eternal. We thank you, Father, that we don't have to go to the temple any longer for worship, that in fact, Christ is our great high priest who intercedes for us. And as long as we are indwelt with the Holy Spirit, we are the bodies of the living temple, that we now take uh, the temple wherever we go. So help us to go into the world, a dark place, that those who don't know you as Savior, and to be your light to a dark world. For it is in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, guys,